Hey guys, how are you? Uh, it's been a few days since I've been in. Uh, yesterday I had to drive down to the Dandenongs to go and pick up my daughter and bring her back to the Epworth. She's got another stay in hospital for a few days just to have a bit more treatment. So uh, yesterday was pretty much out and I try not to work on the weekends. Anyway, today what I want to talk to you about is when coaching feels hard. And I can remember when I first did my coaching training back in around, I think it was 1999 or 2000, something around that stage. And I remember going through that phase of um, conscious incompetence, you know, first that, that first stage of not knowing what you don't know and then realising how much you don't know and, and being consciously competent, knowing that you're doing a job, a good job, but it feels, you, you know, you're conscious of the effort that you're making to moving into that place and, and looking forward to moving into that place where it just feels effortless. And... At its purest form, what I love about coaching is that it feels super, super easy because at the end of the day, hey, Lisa, great to have you on. Um, because when we're at its purest form, coaching is simply asking great questions, having the insight to ask great questions and feeding back information to the client, information that the clients are giving you. And what we know today is that there are so many coaches out there who have not had any formal training whatsoever. Um, they don't understand, having not been through coaching training, that the power is really in helping the client come up with their own answers because pure coaching works on the premise that the client has everything within them, they have all the information within them, and it's up to us to extract it as coaches. Now, if you have never had any formal coaching training, then what tends to happen is people will call themselves coaches even when they're not coaches, when they are um, basically just instructing somebody how to do something or loosely calling it mentoring, and it gets a little bit lost. and people tend to think that coaching is going to someone and they're going to tell you how to do things. And then when it doesn't work out, of course, the um, fault falls back to the coach because they didn't tell them the right information and they didn't succeed at whatever it was that they were trying to achieve, right? So when I did my coaching training, one of the things that I loved about it, and I'm moving back a little bit more towards this type of coaching, and, um, and I'm going to talk about stepping in and out of coaching and mentoring during a session or during a series with a client. But one of the things that I loved about the original coaching training that I did was we set three really solid goals that the client came up with. And um, we did that after a mining process of really getting a full understanding of the client to understand who they were, what made them tick, what was going on in their world. And then they chose these three goals, right? And then over, it was a 12 week coaching package so you would set the goals at the start and then every week you would work on those three specific goals. You would meet deadlines. In the second session, I think it was, we mapped out a bit of a game plan. So, you know, if goal one is this, what are the milestones? What do we need to do to reach that? So that we've both got a plan of action and we know that, okay, this is the goal. This is how we're going to get there. And then the remaining sessions were really just whatever it took to get the person to take action. But along the way, the whole idea was not just to move them towards the goal, but to help them to understand themselves more, see the underlying maybe patterns that had been holding them back, stories that had been holding them back and all the rest of it, and send them on their way feeling really self-sufficient. It's a great system, but it's not perfect. And the reason that I use some of that coaching training, and I used that um, same methodology for many years, and it worked it worked great, but I just found that over time, clients want a little bit more than you basically, it's that classic, you know, when you, you see it on the movies that the client's on the couch and um, the shrink's like, and the client's like, well, what do you think I should do? And the shrink's like, I don't know, what do you think you should do? And sometimes clients need a little bit more than that, especially in the business space. And so I tend to do a mix of coaching and mentoring. So and I'm usually really clear about saying, okay, I'm taking my coaching hat off now 
And this is me just giving you information as a mentor. Um, it's up to you to take this and do whatever you want with it. Um, but I like people to know the distinction between coaching and mentoring or coaching and instruction because coaching is the drawing out of the stuff that you know. It's the drawing out of your greatness and really getting you to act on the stuff that intuitively you know you need to do anyway. But sometimes in a coach-client relationship, the, cl the client maybe has come to you and they're like, okay, I know you know how to do this and I know we have a coaching relationship, but can you just tell me how to do this? And then I think that's perfectly okay. I think it's okay to do both. But when coaching feels hard is when you step way out of the coaching space and you step way into the space of being an expert and the pressure then is on you to deliver. If that's what you're saying, if you're saying, okay, I am going to, um, you know, I know all the answers and I'm going to tell you how to do this and then if you go and do this, it'll work. A lot of the time it will, but a lot of the time clients don't do the things that you ask them to do or do them as fully or do them in the way that you ask them to do them or do them in a timely manner and sometimes the power of it's been lost. And so I think to make coaching easier, it's been really clear. What is coaching? What is my role in this? And if you are a pure, if you are a pure coach and you're calling yourself a coach, remember your job is to listen and to ask really good questions that help draw out the information that the client already has within them. And then it's your job to hold them accountable so that they act on that information. That's not difficult. You know, most people that I know who are coaches have, have had a lifetime of coaching people in one form or another. They're natural born coaches and they're good listeners. Um, but I think when we know a lot, we tend to jump in with the answers too quickly and that's when coaching starts to feel hard. Our clients begin to expect us to have all the answers for them and then it's draining. So coaching really, if it's feeling draining, there's a couple of things. One is that you, you're, the pressure is on you to give too much instead of drawing out from your clients. And the other thing is you're doing the wrong type of coaching or you're with the wrong type of clients. Um, so I did a coaching session with a lady a little while ago and she was drained by her clients. And I said, well, look at the name of your business. You are always going to attract that type of client. Like the name is attracting the type of client that you don't want. And she's like, I never thought of it like that. And so I can ask her to consider doing a brand change. She's still wrestling with that. And it's my intuition that as long as she keeps that business name, she's still, still going to attract clients that are going to drain her. Now, I, did, I had that myself for a long time where I was attracting a lot of clients who, you know, I was very open with my story of growing up in domestic violence and sexual abuse and poverty and all those things. And after I wrote my books, people would come to me with a similar story to that and which is totally fine but it ended up it felt more like counseling to me and it's like I'm not here for that I'm here for helping you move forward but the expectation was that I would be a soft place to land and really you know I had to look at the branding I had to look at the messaging that I was putting out and you'll see now I'll get back to you Lisa um, but you'll see now I very rarely talk about my past history um, because that story is not something I'm ashamed of sharing, but I'm very mindful of the fact that I do tend to attract clients who need a lot more emotional support than I'm willing to give as a coach these days. You know, I'm more about, let's just move you forward. What can we learn from this? Let's just move, move you forward. And what, what have you got inside of you? Because you wouldn't be here if you didn't have the greatness within you. Um, I'm going to pull it out of you. We're going to create a plan of action. I'm going to hold you accountable. Go do it. And if you have a question about something that you know I know about, happy to share it, no problem. But I'm not telling you it's going to work for you just because it worked for me. So that that makes my life a lot easier and it makes me enjoy coaching a whole lot more. Um, I'm just reading Lisa's comment. I struggle with this as a divorce coach. Absolutely. Um, a large part of my role is to educate the divorcing women I'm working with about divorce issues, process, options, etc., etc. The other part is my role is health coaching, divorcing women. Okay, cool. So Lisa, I don't, you're probably doing this already, but for me, the thing that would jump out straight away for me would be 
um, a really powerful framing at the beginning of a coaching relationship. And it'd be something like, look, we're working with a deeply emotional issue. Divorce is going to bring up all sorts of stuff for you. So I suggest that at the time we work together, if you don't already have some sort of emotional support, like a counsellor or a therapist or something like that, maybe look at that. Here's the scope of our sessions. You know, I'm not going to get caught up in talking about the emotional side of things. Of course, you know, it, it's not that I don't care, but as a powerful coach for you and helping you to be able to move through this with a really straight head, we need to keep that conversation entirely separate to the work that I'm doing. And then Lisa, if you did that really powerfully and got better and better at delivering that, I mean, that was just the first pass for me, but if you got really strong and clear about framing that, then you're going to have a much easier time with those people because then when they come to you later on and they're talking to you about the stuff that's draining you, you'd say, look, I'm sorry, but I have to stop you there. Remember we had this conversation at the start and this is kind of moving into that space of where I feel like, you know, it's a conversation you should be having with your therapist. Does that help at all? Um, I know for me, when I was coaching in the early days, I would have loved for somebody to have given me a bit of scripting like that to help me to really set the boundaries. And again, it comes back to those boundaries and it comes back to framing it really powerfully because here's the thing, you know, you teach your clients what is okay and what isn't okay in your coaching client relationship. And when you set it really strongly, um, I'm so glad, Lisa. I hope that makes your life a little bit easier because I imagine it would be very, very, very draining working in that space. And I know it's a space where it's you want to be, it's a, it's a powerful place to coach and you can do a lot of great work there. But, yeah, you want to make sure that it's not costing you that emotional um, heavy lifting, you know, every time you work with a client because it's not fun. And the great thing about knowing and going into each session as the purest coach the purest coach you could you can be you've then got somewhere to go you know so if you're working with a client and you go in and you're working with a client and you say to yourself as you go into each session I don't have to have the answers, I just need to, and this is what I used to say to myself all the time, you don't need to have the answers, you just need to listen. Because when I listen, I pick up on everything that I'm supposed to pick up on. I have the conversations that we're supposed to have to move the person forward. But if I'm in there thinking about, oh, they're going to want to know about this and oh, I hope I give them the right answer and you get in the way of good coaching. You put yourself firmly in the middle of having a good coaching conversation. So, um, yeah, go into it with pure coaching. So I don't need to have any of the answers. I just need to tune in and listen and then be courageous enough to feed back that information and, and ask the right questions. It's as simple as that. And then if there's a specific, like, um, as I say, instructional type part where, so for example, me, you know, working with clients to help them launch stuff online. A lot of the coaching is drawing out what is the sort of coach you want to be, what sort of, who, do, who are the clients that you want to work with, what sort of branding do we want to have, what's the program you want to deliver. That's all very coaching based. And then I put my mentor hat on and say, look, I, here's why I think this isn't going to work based on my experience. Now go away and think about it. Or this is how you create the funnel. This is the first step. This is the second step. This is how you do it. Now go do it. And it feels the perfect mix for me for the type of coaching that I'm doing. Um, it's not going to be enough for people to come to me and know of me as the person that helps them create online programs and then me not give them any information about how to create an online program. But if I was a pure coach and not a strategist, as well, then I wouldn't be doing any of those things. It wouldn't be within my scope as a coach to do those things. I hope that makes sense. So go into your coaching um, sessions and your coaching relationships from a purely coaching perspective, and then you have room to move. But make sure that when you sell a package, you know what you're offering. You know, if I'm never going to a purely coaching program because I know I've got too much to give out of the coaching. Anyway, um, I don't want to walk on. People are going to see the video and they're like, oh, it's too long. 
and I want people to watch this one because I think it's really important. It's really important and it's so, um, it's, I know it's something that coaches struggle with a lot and I know I struggled with it a lot in the early days and I am so tough these days with my coaching clients in terms of, you know, I know, I know what my scope is, I know what I promise, it's all in the contract, I know exactly what I promise, I know, I only promise what I know I can deliver and then the rest is up to the clients and they either will or they won't, um, sorry, who knows, will, they either will or they won't implement the, the technical stuff. Um, so work out what is the right balance for you, coaching and strategy, purely coaching, um, you know, and another great tool that coaches have is um, being able to refer people. So for you, Lisa, you know, in the instance of having clients that are coming to you as, um, you know, they're going through the divorce process and you're coaching them through that, that's great. Um, but, you know, if they don't have some sort of therapy that they and you think they need it, it's good to have someone to refer them to. Um, and I was just going to say, Lisa, as well, and you really keeping those boundaries super strong and removing all of the emotional conversation and support out of it, it just means that you can be a much more powerful coach for them in that space. And it means that this side of it is going to feel more logical and strategic than emotional. And then they'll do what they need to do, which is you know, going to help you get a better result for your clients. And it's going to be more powerful for them and it's going to be more powerful for you. Anyway, I hope that helped. Um, felt like a good conversation. And you might have noticed I've just really recently stepped further and further and further into the coaching um, side of things and really owning my role as a coach. Um, yeah, it is huge. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, I really did step back from calling myself a coach for a while because there were so many shit ones out there and so many people calling themselves coaches who weren't actually coaches. They'd just done something and then decided that they were going to call themselves, you know, they might have had some success in something and then they just hung up a shingle and said, well, now I'm a coach in that space. And look, not everybody needs formal coaching training, but most people would benefit from knowing you know, having gone through it or even if it's a self-study or something like that because the coaching framework and the coaching questioning is so powerful. It's, it's, it's an incredible tool. Anyway, so I'm coach again because coaching's in my blood and I'm, I've fallen so in love with it again. I've fallen so in love with coaching and the coaching world and these conversations feel so easy for me. And um, the reason they feel easy is I've been coaching for, you know, really I've been coaching since 91 and, but officially coaching after my qualifications, it's about 1999. So that's a long time. That's coming up to 20 years in like a, the qualified coaching realm. There aren't a lot of coaches that have been around for that long, um, who are willing to teach stuff, you know, and, um, Will Smith is calling himself a life coach. Oh, <laughs> love it, love it. Um, but yeah, I'm really going to invite the community to just own being a coach again and make it a profession that we're proud of, you know, instead of something that, you know, it's, it was being laughed at for such a long time because it, it had such a poor name. And, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> Coaching is a fantastic tool. It's never going away. It's always going to be around. People are always going to need coaches. And it's up to us to really elevate the coaching profession and feel good about calling ourselves coaches because that's how we elevate ourselves and we elevate our industry again. And, you know, I remember in my other business, Rise, we're not a coaching business. We're a training organisation. Um, but I remember feeling so good about calling ourselves a training organisation and not a coaching um, business because I was so over coaching and everything that went along with it. And now I feel like that's great and it has its place and it's very um, easy. I see it as very clean work because there's no emotional stuff and it's like we have a syllabus and we take people through a syllabus and then, you know, it's it's easy here are the KPIs um, but in doing that it made me see how much I really miss coaching <laughs> and so I'm back um, 
simply do face and face and coach is cozy. Tell me a bit more about that, Lisa. So you said you've noticed a lot of people calling themselves coaches these days simply do Facebook. Like, yeah, I know. I know. You know, the thing that I see all the time, and this is not a criticism, but there's one coach that I know in particular and um, over the last, I met him a few years ago um, in the States and what I've noticed is um, you know, he's investing a lot of money with different programs, um, you know, big programs that we all know, Tony Robbins, things like that. And yet everything on his timeline is a quote from somebody else and or Gary Vee or um, Tony Robbins or Grant Cardone or, you know, people like that. And he's not the only one. There's a lot of people doing it. And I just think, like, I really do that because I think I've got my own stuff. <laughs> you know, I've got my own stuff to share. And... I don't know. I just think I want to see you in your coaching business. I don't want to see you spewing out other people's information. I don't want to see you um, quoting Tony Robbins as a way to inspire me. They quote Tony Robbins and yeah, yeah. Look, and that's okay. You know that. Um, I don't know. I just, I just feel like this is a whole conversation for another day. I'm sure, but. For me, I really feel like um, I want to see you. I want to see what you know. I don't want to see that you know Tony Robbins' quotes or Tony Robbins' work. You know, I did Tony's stuff when Chloe was eight weeks old. I did my first Tony Robbins thing and Chloe's 20 now. So I've been in that space for a long time, but you rarely see me quote Tony Robbins um, or anyone else. You might see the occasional Oprah quote or something like that. Um, but for me, yeah, I, I, I want to share my own stuff. I mean, that's, that's what makes us unique and that's what makes people um, love us, you know, because, because we're us. When all you do is regurgitate other people's information, I think it's okay to have a conversation about it, you know, but I don't know if that's all you're doing, um, then where's you in that? Like, why wouldn't I just go to Tony Robbins? So why wouldn't I just go and sign up for an online Tony Robbins course? Because, yeah, anyway, I'm getting lost. I'm, I'm ranting. Um, but I hope today was really useful. It feels good. I'm so excited to have more juicy conversations like this. Please, let's get this group pumping. I want more people in it. So um, if you haven't already, please invite some people to come along and um, be part of the group. Anyway, that's my doorbell. I'm going to go. Bye.